So uh, let's take out our Bibles this morning and we'll turn to the book of 1 John once again. The book of 1 John. And we have, uh, we're have we plowing through this series of messages through the book of 1 John. And uh, just uh, it's one of these series of messages where our, 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 our direction here is just to go through this book verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph. And, uh, and so that we can kind of see uh, what, the, what the message of the Lord is in this wonderful book. So before we get into the message this morning, Morning. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray and uh, we'll ask for the Lord's blessing on this time that we have in his word today. Father, we ask for your blessing, for your grace as we open up your word today. We pray that you would speak to us from heaven. We pray that you would challenge us encourage us help us to grow as christians in this time that we have together today i pray lord that whatever our burdens are that the believer would be called upon to cast our burdens upon the lord and lord that i pray that for all of those here who don't yet know Christ as Savior, that today would be the day that they would heed the call of the gospel. The words of Jesus, Come unto me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I pray that those would find rest for their souls in the person and work of Jesus Christ today. Oh, Lord, uh, I pray that with all of the busyness that you would calm our hearts with all of the uh, things that are going on in our lives, that this would be a time of spiritual of, of reflection upon your word and uh, a time when you really do a work in our hearts. Oh Lord, I pray for our young people today in junior church that you would touch their hearts and lift their eyes unto Jesus. And I pray for gospel proclaiming ministries all around this community and all around the world that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be proclaimed powerfully today by your spirit and without, uh, without shame today and that you would sweep countless souls into the kingdom of heaven by the proclamation of the word today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, we all, we all want assurance, right? We all want certainty. We all want to know where things are going. And, you know, sometimes even if the news that I'm going to get is bad news, even if it's not what I wanted to hear, knowing bad news is very often better than the mental quicksand of the unknown, isn't it? The unknown is just a quagmire that sucks us in and sometimes it seems that it sucks the very life out of us. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 says that this book has been given to us by the Lord so that we might know that we have eternal life. So that the true believer would be certain and assured of their standing in Christ. But you know, sometimes our temptation is to take verses like this. These things I've written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And we try to apply them to people who are not qualified for that statement. It's not given to everybody. It is called to those who believe on the name of the Son of God. It's called to, it is directed toward the believer. Those who know Christ, they are the ones who are qualified to have this assurance. This 
epistle, 1 John, and I've said this over and over again, and when we finally finish this series one of these days, this is going to be one of those statements that's going to haunt you in your sleep, that the, the book of 1 John leaves us either assured or exposed. And if you want to write that down in your Bible as the theme of the book, it is, a the, it is the theme. We are either assured by this book of our, of our standing in Christ, or we are exposed as a false professor, a hypocrite. As I said last week, if there is one area in which the devil is actively seeking to sow the seeds of confusion and actively seeking to sow the seeds of deception, it is in this area of what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to have, uh, to have, this, uh, to have Jesus Christ as your Savior, to have peace with God, to be rightly related to God? God. That's the very point that Jesus made in the parable of the, of the wheat and the tares. There are people who profess to be Christians. There are people that come and uh, mix in with believers week after week after week. People who make a profession of knowing Christ that it is not the true heart reality. And the, in, the, in that parable of the wheat and the tares, the Lord makes it clear that this is the, there is a diabolical, there is a satanic purpose in this, so as to muddy those waters of what it means to be a true Christian. In the past two weeks, we've been in 1 John chapter 3. And verse 10 says that in many ways, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. He says this is, it is a clear thing. It is an obvious thing. Here are those who are the true believers. Here are those who are not. It shouldn't be a confusing issue. It shouldn't be a difficult issue. But here's the thing. Imposters abound. Now, I'll give you a, a little peek into my twisted sense of humor here. I'm going to show you a couple of slides, but I'm going to warn you ahead of time that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the image on our slide projector is not that big. We have a very old projector that we need to replace. So if you are like halfway back, you're, gonna, you're, you're probably not going to be able to actually see, uh, see the slides. So that's why you should sit in the front row, okay? So yeah, I'll just give you that. If you can't see it, that it's on you. You had plenty of, there, there are plenty of seats available on the front row, okay? So, uh, but anyways, um, it's a, it is a cartoon here, and uh, there's a bunch of, uh, bunch of sheep, and they all are clearly in costume, and there's a couple of wolves that are in sheep's costume that they finally take the mask off, and they say, wait a minute, is anyone here a real sheep? And, uh, you know, that's not the way it should, but there are wolves in sheep's clothing, but uh, this other one, and probably if, if you're very far back, it just looks like a dark picture. But uh, there's uh, gorillas there, and there's clearly there's some a tourist that is dressed up as a gorilla, and he's got a, a camera hanging around his neck. And so the, the gorillas are saying to this one, so you're a real gorilla, are you? Well, guess you wouldn't mind munching down a few beetle grubs, would you? In fact, we want to see you chug them. And, uh, you know, that uh, that's, uh, separates the uh, the true from the, uh, from the imposters, right? Right? You know what? The Bible tells us, you know, the, uh, the imposter gorilla is going to have a little bit of trouble uh, when, uh, when it comes down to chugging down those beetle grubs. You know, the Bible makes it clear there, th there are certain things that are going to mark the true believer. Certain things, certain characteristics that are going to mark the true believer that are going to make that distinction between the imposter, the hypocrite, and the true believer. And 1 John is going after this over and over and over again. Here is what marks the true believer. 
uh, what we I said that uh, what we believe. You know, John John talks about the doctrinal test. He talks about the moral test. What we believe determines what we love, and what we love determines how we behave. And so John is saying here, you cannot divorce belief and behavior. You can't do it. It all flows through the heart. So let's read 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to begin our reading in verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. The word means clear. It means obvious. The children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, for he does not, uh, or nor he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteousness. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Over the last two weeks, we covered this subject of the believer's attitude, the believer's disposition towards sin. Now, I said over the last two weeks that when we talk about the believer's disposition, attitude towards sin, we're not talking about perfection in this life. We are talking about direction in life, okay? Um, we are, sin for the believer is no longer a rule authority. Sin is present, but it is uh, sin is, is no longer a ruling authority. It is, the, is it a usurper in our lives. Now we come to this issue of loving others. Both of these issues have already been addressed in this book. We covered this in chapter 2, that when, we, uh, when, we're, tr when we're a true believer, we're going to hate sin. We're going to love God. We're also going to love others, and especially believers. So uh, I imagine when I, when I read passages, when I read the, uh, passages like the book of First John, and it's going over and over, coming, circling back to the same issue over and over again, I almost imagine it as uh, in the old days when the guys were, uh, when people were constructing the railroads. And what would they do? They would have these huge spikes. They're driving through those ties into the ground, and you'd have a couple of men that are working on that same same spike, right? And they would have to work out that rhythm where one hits it, then the other hits it, then the one hits it, and then the other hits it. And, you know, a lot of things could go wrong in that process, right? I'm thankful I, don't, I, didn't, I never had to have that job. But that's kind of what's going on in 1 John. We've got these three hammers that are, that, are, that, are, that are hitting this spike of the assurance of salvation over and over again. The issue of what we believe, the issue of, how, of our love for other believers, the issue of our hatred for sin, and this is, and John is coming back to this over and over again, and the rest of the book is just going to continue to pound these same, uh, the, the assurance spike with these same three hammers. 
Verse 11 says this point, uh, says that it says at this point that the believer uh, loves his brother. And he says, you have heard this from the beginning. And that's actually the same thing that was stated in chapter 2 and verse 7, where John said this issue of loving your brothers is something that you have known from the beginning. This is not a new commandment. The commandment to love others is all through the Old Testament. This commandment to love others, and especially other believers, is repeated by Jesus. He even said in John chapter 13 and verse 35, he said, this is the way that people are going to know that you are my disciples disciples, that you are believers because you love one another. You love one another. It's more than a duty. I mean, it was commanded by the Lord, but it's more than a duty. It is more than a duty because it was exemplified. It was lived out by Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that the believer is united to Jesus Christ, inseparable from Jesus Christ. So that when God looks at the believer, he doesn't see our faults and failures, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which has been applied to the, to the believer at the cost of the blood of Jesus himself. So we being united to Jesus Christ are united to that perfect love for the believer. It's uh, to such an extent, and, this, and, and what Jesus has done for us in our union with Christ has enlarged our capacity to love to such an extent that the Bible says this is one of the hallmark characteristics of every believer. One of the hallmark characteristics that you will see in every believer. We don't always see it perfectly, but if a person person is a true believer, you should see some evidence of an inclination to love other believers. John says, you've heard this from the beginning. It's something that you used to have a close, a close tabs on. He's saying you had it settled at, at one time, but it seems now that the people to whom John wrote... Some factors have come in and it's confused you a little bit and you're starting to get off track. We all know what it's like uh, to lose something, right? Some of us a little better than others. And every time you lose something, you lose your phone, you lose your keys, you lose your you know, whatever, there's always got to be some smarty pants that's going to, when you, you're frantically looking around for that thing, some smarty pants is going to come along and say, well, where did you have it last? If I knew where I had it last, I would know where it was! Right? John said, you know, sometimes you, you, you get out, you know, we were just on a church camping trip, we did a little bit of hiking, and on well-marked paths, but, you know, there have been times when I've been out in the woods hiking, and suddenly you say, you know what, I think I'm off the trail. I think I, I've gotten off track, and so when you are hiking, you're in the woods, and you all of a sudden realize, hey, you know what, I don't think I'm in the spot where I think I am. What are you thinking back to? Okay, when was the last time that I was confident that I was on the trail. How long has it been since I was really sure that I was where I thought I was? And so John is saying to these people, hey, think back. This is something that you have known from the beginning. This is not new material. You're struggling right now. Look back. Think of the last time you were on track. Get back on solid, unconfused ground. And John's saying, hey, this issue of loving your brother brothers and sisters in Christ is not new teaching. It's not a new revelation. You have known this. 
In fact, you know, every Sunday I get up here and I preach. I give you a message on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Never one time have I given you any new material. I've never given you any new material. I've never given you something that is novel. I've never said to you, hey, this is the first time that you will ever hear what I'm about to say. Why? Because if it's as far as biblical preaching goes, if it's new, it's not true. Everything that the church has is given to us in this book. It's no new material. John says, hey, you've had this from the beginning. Think back. Get back to that unconfused ground. And here John contrasts the children of God, once again, contrasts the children of God and the children of the devil. In prior passage, he said, children of God hate sin. Children of God, their inclination is to get away from sin more and more, get closer and closer to God. Hate sin. Now he says the next thing that is a hallmark characteristic of the Christian is we love. We love. What is it that marks a child of God? Number one, the child of God loves other believers. The child of God loves other believers. And it's not that we don't love other people who are not believers also. You know, those commands are clear in the Bible as well. That we are to love, you know, Jesus said, love your enemies. Love those who are, who are set to harm you. Love them and do good to them. So it's not that that's not also true, but here the emphasis is we are to love other believers. And he gives an example of the children of the devil. Uh, as an example of the children of the devil, uh, the, the Cain and Abel incident. Now, uh, so if you're familiar, you're probably familiar with that. That is way back at the, in the book of Genesis, the Cain and Abel incident. And uh, this example is hatred as far as hatred could go. Cain hated Abel so much that it drove him to murder his own brother. Every time I think of the Cain and Abel incident, I can't get out of my head. There was a time, the, in fact, it was the night that I preached my first sermon. It was a, it was a, it was a New Year's Eve service, and there were four or five uh, young boys in the church that felt called to ministry. And so the, the preacher said, okay, I'm going to give each of you guys five minutes to preach. I mean, we've got to have a service. You know, this stretch is past midnight, so, you know, there's got to be some guys up there to preach. So we're going to give all these young fellows five minutes to preach. It was the longest five minutes in my life. I preached everything I knew from the Bible and a lot extra as well. I think I probably got into some false doctrine. If I, I was done. Five minutes. There's nothing more I could say. Preach Genesis or Revelation, I think. Now I can't even introduce my text in five minutes. But one of the guys, uh, he was going to preach on Cain and Abel. And he got so twisted around, he couldn't remember which was which. He says, uh, Cain killed Abel. No, Abel killed Cain. He says, it was just a big fight. Every time I take it, I can't tell. I remember those words every time I get to that story. But, you know, Cain hated his brother Abel. And that hatred went as far as it could go to the point of murder. Remember in Matthew chapter 5, the Lord Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you know, you congratulated yourselves that you have never committed murder. But he says, uh, don't, uh, don't be so quick to congratulate yourself because that commandment, you shall not kill, is not just the end act. It is a process and everything that is included in that pathway to murder is included in that prohibition. And what does it start with? The first step down that path is entertaining negative, hateful thoughts against someone else. It's a path. Just like uh, Jesus went on to say that an improper look at someone else, sensual thoughts about another person that is not your spouse, that is that first step down the path toward adultery. Don't be so quick to pat yourself on the back that you've not reached the end of the road because if you've gotten on that road at all, you are guilty of breaking that commandment. Thoughts of discontentment and envy and covetousness are the first thought, are the first steps down the path that leads to stealing. But think for a minute with me about Cain and Abel. 
Cain and Abel. Two young men grew up in the same household, right? They had the same parents, Adam and Eve. Their parents were people who at one time, physically, the Bible says, they walked with God every day in the Garden of Eden. Think about that with me for a minute. Cain and Abel grew up with these people as mom and dad who could sit down every day and talk about what it was like to physically walk in the presence of God every day until, until they sinned. But when God commanded Cain and Abel to bring a sacrifice, Abel followed the path that God had established. Abel followed the directives that God gave. Cain, did he refuse to bring a sacrifice? We often think about Cain as just being uh, disobedient to what God had said. But think with me for a minute. Did Cain bring a sacrifice to God? Yes, he did. He did not just blatantly uh, say he wasn't going to do it. But Cain wanted to do things his own way. Cain wanted to bring a sacrifice, but on his own terms. And when God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but rejected Cain's, Cain was so irate and turned his anger on his brother. His brother Abel didn't do anything against him, but Cain was so angry because God had rejected his sacrifice and he turned his anger on his brother and killed him. Verse 13 says, We are not to be surprised when the world hates us. You see, Cain was the first of this pathway that we see so prevalent today. And the overwhelming majority of people in the world today are on the pathway of Cain. What is the way of Cain? The way of Cain is this. Everybody has their own way to God. You know, you're, as long as you are good and as long as you are sincere and as long as you are doing the best you can, certainly God will accept what you have to bring to him. That was the way of Cain. God, I'll, do, I'll bring you a sacrifice, but I'm not going to bring you the one that you want. I'll bring you the one that I want to bring you. That's the pathway of Cain. If there's one thing that this world hates, if there is one thing that this world will not tolerate, and that is why the, why the Bible says don't be surprised when the world hates you, this world hates it when someone stands up and says, you know what, there is one pathway to God. John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. One path to God. It is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And if you want to say something that will stir up anger to people around you, that's what it will be. Jesus says, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when people don't like what you have to say, when people hate you. Cain was so angry and turned his anger against Abel and killed his own brother. I mean, think about it. Here is Abel, and here is Cain, excuse me, and Cain refuses to bring an animal to slaughter an, uh, an animal to bring as a sacrifice to God. But what does he do? He slaughters his own brother. Cain was, the Bible says here, of the wicked one. And the word for wicked here is an active evil that seeks to bring down everyone else in its wickedness. Bringing down, bringing as much destruction as possible. That was the devil. That was the way of uh, the fall of Lucifer from, uh, from of old that in his sin brought down other angels also in his rebellion against God. Active evil. That was the devil. That was the way of Cain. Whenever Abel is mentioned in the New Testament, I think only with one exception, when the Bible talks about Abel, it refers to him as righteous. 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 
Cain, generally, when it refers to him, it refers to him being the wicked one. There are many people who profess to be believers. Many people who, they would say, oh yes, I have trusted Jesus as my Savior. But whenever you talk to them about Christianity, whenever you talk to them about other believers and those worshiping together in the house of the Lord, they have nothing but negative things to say. I can't tell you how many people that I've known in 25 plus years of ministry that have come in and out of the doors of churches. Something happened. They get disillusioned. They get angry. Some other Christian maybe really did them wrong. And forever now, they just have this negative spirit, not only toward this one person, but toward all Christians. And they have nothing but negative to say negative things to say toward believers and toward Christianity in general. How many times have you heard people say ridiculous things like, I love God, but I just can't stand Christians? You read the book of 1 John, John says, don't say stupid stuff like that. That's in the original language, by the way. John says, you can't say that. That is self-contradictory. You can't say, I love God, but I don't love Christians. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. People say things like, I, I, I love God. I just can't stand religion. You need to talk to people. And by the way, what's wrong with that statement? Well, you know, there is, there is superficial religion. There is false religion. But the Bible says there is also true religion. Religion is the worship of God. So don't, uh, don't get caught up in this throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We love God and we worship God in the true religion that is described in his word. You talk to people, and all they ever want to talk about is how terrible of a uh, uh, how terrible some professing Christian was. They never forget the bad testimony. They never forget something wrong that some professing Christian did to them, and they completely ignore all of the believers that down through their lives have shown the love of Jesus Christ and the beauty of the message of the gospel all around them. They completely ignore that. You get a burr in your saddle, maybe even in a bad situation, and you never get over it. People live life negative and sour and bitter against Christians while at the same time claiming to be one themselves. John here says that if you are bitter, if you are negative, if you are not loving toward other Christians, you may claim to be a Christian, but you are not a Christian. Plain and simple, you're not one. You're like Cain. You are of the wicked one and not like Abel, the righteous one. So let me say this to you. Watch your words. Watch your words. And down through the years, I've many, many times taken somebody aside that somebody has been legitimately wronged by another Christian. And every time they talk, they talk about all this negative stuff about Christianity. Watch your words. The Bible says that the church, the true church, those who truly know Christ, it calls us the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. You know, you can insult a man all you want. But when you, to that man's face, you insult his bride, you got a problem on your hands, don't you? The church is the bride of Christ. Be careful how you speak. Be careful of your demeanor toward other Christians. This is the family of God. So number one, the child of God loves other believers. Number two, the child of God actively serves other believers. Not only do we not hate, but instead of hatred, we actively love 
The text says that we are not, since we love other believers, we are not indifferent. We are at, toward them. We are actively serving them as followers of Jesus Christ. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Very important passage here. Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse 1. It says, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind, what kind of mind? This mind of looking out for others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Actively serving other believers. Having a direction in life that is said to lay down my life for brothers in Christ, for sisters in Christ. How can I help you? How can I serve you? How can I be an, an encouragement to you? How often are we guilty? And we've all been guilty. I have been guilty of this. Of having this pity party. I came to church and no one said anything nice to me. I came to church and no one encouraged me. I came to church and nobody saw that I was having a hard time and reached out to, uh, to help me out. The Bible says that we, I mean, we, when we come, when we worship together, we ought to go away having been blessed, okay? But our purpose is we gather together, we are, get, we, are, we are coming in to serve, to worship the Lord by being a blessing to one another. We find out when we do that, when you set out to be a blessing to others, without exception, what do you find? You get the biggest blessing of all. You found that to be true in your life. When you set up, when you're trying to figure out how other people are going to help you, you always end up empty handed, don't you? When you set out to serve one, another person, you find out that even though you got to serve them, the bigger blessing became yours. Let this mind be in you, which also is in Christ Jesus. He came not to, not to be served, but to serve. Looking out for the interests of others, not just ourselves. That's the example of our Savior who left the glories of heaven to humble himself to be a servant and even to die on the cross for our sins. That was the heart of Jesus. How can we say that we are followers of Jesus Christ and live selfishly? How can we say that we are followers of Jesus Christ and not be willing to lay our lives down for other people? Oh, I don't like doing this. Oh, I don't like doing that. Oh, people never appreciate me. Come on, get over yourself. Get over yourself. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, and I want to begin reading in verse 14. James, the book of James is, is uh, very similar to the book of 1 John. James is talking about here is what true saving faith looks like. And he says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? Literally, can that kind of faith, empty of works, is that the kind of faith that saves a person? If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? 
Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. John says that to act this way, to act in a way that is indifferent toward the needs of other people. To act in this way that James describes. James describes someone, uh, someone coming to the church service. Someone coming that clearly has needs. Someone that you can tell, you talk to that person, you get to know that person, they don't have a place to live, they don't have food to eat, they don't have proper clothing to wear, they have a serious need. What's our temptation sometimes? Our temptation is sometimes to say, God bless you, I'll be praying for you, hope it works out for you. That's what James says. Don't just say to that person, be warmed and filled. Hope it all works out for you. He says, no, if you truly love that person, what are you going to do? You are going to set out to be a part of the answer to that prayer. Don't just say you have faith. Show your faith by your works. Faith is active. John says that when we act this way, John kind of gives a similar example. He says that, uh, that Jesus laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives lives for the brethren who verse 17 whoever has this world's goods your needs are are being met right now and you have a brother who is in need you see your brother in need and you shut up your heart from him how does the love of god abide in this kind of person does it work it's not a characteristic of saving faith. You don't respond to someone who has needs by shutting up your heart to that person. Have you ever done that? I would bet there is not a person in this room, myself included, that has not been guilty of that at some time. We've all been tempted in this way. We love big. We love deep. We give ourselves for other people. If you open up your heart, if you love people as Jesus has called us to love them, mark it down, you will be hurt. You will be hurt. You will be hurt deeply. But when you love big, you will be hurt big, but realize that you are following your, a path that has been blazed by our Savior Himself because He was hurt worse than any. Our temptation is when we are hurt, when we are disappointed, when love is not reciprocated, we close up our hearts. Oh, I did help that person. Oh, I did invite them out for coffee, but they never invited me back. See if I ever do that again. Oh, I helped that person move, but then when I was moving, guess who didn't call to see if I needed help? Never doing that again. What's that? Closing up your heart. Closing up your heart because you have been disappointed. Shutting people out. John says that... This is not a demonstration of what it looks like to be a true follower of Jesus. Back in James chapter 1 and verse 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. What we believe, John, uh, James says, pure and undefiled religion, what we believe determines what we love. That is, uh, he says, these are the people that are out there trying to be a blessing to those who don't have the means. And he gives the example of orphans and widows. And therefore, what we believe determines what we love and therefore how we behave. He says the other aspect of true and undefiled religion is keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. 
So if you're a Christian, if you know Christ is your Savior, you're not to be selfish. Not to be setting out to protect yourself. The believer, John says, is characterized by being willing to give our lives away. Are you willing to? Are you willing to give your life away? Oh, sure. I'll open myself up. Oh, sure. I will love this person. Am I going to get hurt? Yes, I'm going to get hurt. But I'm, I'm charging headlong into it. I know I'm going to get hurt. But it's in keeping with the example of my Savior. I'm going to open myself up to rejection. Yes. I'm going to open myself up to even hatred sometimes. Yes. But that's the pathway my master walked. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. I'm giving my life as a sacrifice, Paul says, for the service of your faith. In fact, you know what? If you read the chapters, Romans chapter 9 and Romans 10, I was just reading these chapters in my devotions the other day. Paul said, and this is recorded by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. So this was the true heart of Paul. Paul says, if it meant my fellow countrymen going to heaven, I would be willing to go to hell. Wow, what a statement. What a statement. Am I willing to give myself? I remember years ago, we got a call from a uh, young couple that was moving to this area. And they, I don't think there's a person in this room that would know who in the world I'm talking about. So I think I can share this pretty safely. So we got a call from a couple that were moving here from out of state. And they said, oh, we're looking for a church to attend in that area. They said, oh, that'd be, and we talked about what we believe. They said, oh, we'd, we'd love to come and to, and to worship with you there. And uh, so they, uh, they came to the area for a weekend before they headed back out of state. And they, they came to church. Oh, yeah, this is a great church. We love this place. And a few weeks later, they said, hey, we're, we're moving into, uh, into this uh, uh, three-family place in Fall River and uh, any way we can get some help moving in. Absolutely. Got uh, like several men to go. And you know how it goes, right? We got couches that have got to go up to the third floor. And uh, I remember the couches. I remember uh, china cabinets. And we're hoisting those things up with ropes up to a balcony on the third floor. It was ugly. It was ugly. They never came back to church after, they, after we moved them in. Never came back. And I remember the other guys that helped in that moving process. There was a lot of labor in that. I remember us getting together saying, I can't believe this. Can't believe this. We were cheap labor. We got taken advantage of. Let me tell you something. That stings. And I've seen these people since then. I saw them a couple years ago. You know what I try to do? I try to love them. Not easy. Because I never forget moving that stuff and them never coming back to church. I say that's my flesh speaking. But you know what? I've got to tame my flesh by what Jesus said. You gotta love people. You gotta give yourself for people. Who sees it? The Lord sees it. What would Jesus have done? I bet Jesus would have done the same thing, except much better, with a better attitude than I had. We gotta be willing to give of ourselves. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love just in word. Don't just love in tongue by what you say, but love in deed and in truth. Sincerely, honestly love. By this we know that we are of the truth. And that means a true Christian and shall assure our hearts before him. You want to be sure you're saved? Is this true of your life? Does a love for other believers characterize your heart? Again, John is saying profession is not enough. 
No matter what you claim to be, you can say you are a Christian. You can say it till you're blue in the face that you know Jesus Christ. But John here says, here is another thing that tells the tale of where you are spiritually. Your love and your active service for believers tells the true tale of whether you are a Christian. Again, in this way, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. How about you? Where's your heart? Is your heart inclined to open itself up? Is your heart inclined to serve others? When was the last time you sacrificially gave of yourself for the benefit of another believer? People with whom you worship. When was the last time? If you've got to dig deep, Maybe some warnings, warning flags should start to wave. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would help us in this. We seek to have assurance. We want to know that our hearts are right with God. But Lord, it's so easy. The devil has sown seeds of confusion and doubt so that today it's one of the most confusing issues that people have. What does it mean to be a true Christian? I pray that looking into the mirror of the Word today that we would either be assured of our salvation or concerned that maybe something isn't right. And oh Lord, I pray that going away from this place today that each person would know that their heart is right with God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.